So in this first video, we'll look at some historical figures in establishing psychology as a scientific discipline. Specifically, uh, we'll look at uh, three different periods in the history of psychology. Firstly, the philosophical uh, ideas of people like Plato and Aristotle. We'll also touch on uh, Descartes' views about consciousness and, and where the mind resides. Um, towards the end of the video, we'll also look at uh, Wilhelm Wundt, which is uh, someone who is widely known as being uh, the founder of modern psychology. Um, and his uh, views around kind of establishing the structure of consciousness. And we'll also look at William James's views on the functions of mental processes as well. Now, the philosophical origins of psychology really uh, divide into two different camps. The first one is about the nature and the structure of the mind or the psyche, as it was referred to uh, back to the uh, ancient philosophers. Um, and the second part of their thinking was related to the location of the mind. So where does it reside? Is it a part of us as people? Is it a material thing uh, that is part of us? Or is it some kind of thing that is external to us? Um, thinking about the structure of consciousness and thinking about the structure of the mind, uh, Plato in his uh, text, The Republic, uh, divided the mind into three distinct parts. He first said that he, the uh, logisticon was related to intellect and reasoning and applying logic to making a decision. Um, he then had two uh, different, uh, more emotional or instinctive uh, aspects of the mind, the thumos and the epithematicon. Uh, what he suggested later in his life was that these might form a, a distinct part or a, a holistic part of the mind, uh, favouring a more uh, dual process to uh, the mind, thinking about one half of the mind being related to intellect and rationality and another half of the mind related to desire and appetite. Uh, Aristotle uh, had a similar kind of approach to uh, delineating different parts of the mind. Uh, he first suggested that the mind is the primary reason for existence, or the first entelechy, as he referred to it. Uh, he also had uh, three distinct parts, or a tripartite view, of what the mind is. Uh, the first one was related to libido. Um, now, he suggested that uh, people's primary motivation, and the mind's primary motivation, was to reproduce different ideas. Uh, so he referred to that as a drive to reproduce in the form of libido. He then had uh, two other parts of the mind, again, kind of mapping onto Plato's idea of desire or emotion versus reason and rationality. Uh, and he labelled those the id and the ego. And some of you might be familiar uh, with those labels from Freud's work, which we'll look at in the next video. Now, moving on to uh, the mind-body problem. So where does the mind actually reside? Um, you did have a bit of a, uh, a disagreement between Plato and Aristotle about where the mind actually resides in relation to the body. So Plato was what's referred to as a dualist who assumes that the mind and the body are separate entities. Now he uh, set this out by suggesting that our, um, our experiences are not new. We don't learn um, how to uh, make sense of the world. We have a store of uh, memories. So when we experience something for the first time, we're not experiencing it for the first time. We're remembering what it's like to experience that and we're drawing on that mental store that is within our mind. Now he suggested that this means that uh, the mind and the body are separate entities. Our body is a vehicle that allows us to experience those recollections of memories, whereas the mind is something that lives on uh, after us and also comes before us. Uh, this type of um, approach is often referred to as Cartesian dualism. Um, and this is because uh, Descartes is one of the philosophers who is most well known for expressing this kind of view. Um, he's got this uh, very famous quote, cogito ego sum, I think therefore I am. Um, what this stems from is uh, Descartes' view that he can doubt the existence of everything except for the experience of his mind or the uh, presence of his self as a thinking being. So he suggested that uh, he can assume that everything, all of his experiences are false and that uh, all of his experiences are no more true than the contents of what's in his dream. But the very fact that he can uh, contemplate whether or not something is, uh, is something in reality suggests to him that his mind is real. And this mind is the only thing that he cannot doubt the existence of. 
So with that in mind, because he can't doubt the existence of his mind, but he can doubt the existence of his body and his external experience of his body, then his mind and his body must be separate entities. Now, Aristotle had a different uh, view of this. He suggested that the mind resides within the body. So what this means is that the body is interacting with uh, the external world and is learning how to experience different sensations. So the mind is therefore within the body. The body is allowing the mind to learn new experiences. And this is called monism, the mind and the body being one whole entity. Now this mind-body problem is something that plagues psychological thought and the philosophy of science and the philosophy of the mind uh, even to this day. Um, there's a really nice video uh, by Ted Ebb that considers the mind-body problem um, and looks at all of the different uh, views surrounding the mind-body problem and we're going to look at that uh, in the next clip. Look at your hand. How do you know it's really yours? It seems obvious, unless you've experienced the rubber hand illusion. In this experiment, a dummy hand is placed in front of you and your real hand is hidden behind a screen. Both are simultaneously stroked with a paintbrush. No matter how much you remind yourself the dummy hand isn't yours, you eventually start to feel like it is and inevitably flinch when it's threatened with a knife. That may just be a temporary trick, but it speaks to a larger truth. Our bodies, the physical, biological parts of us, and our minds, the thinking, conscious aspects, have a complicated, tangled relationship. Which one primarily defines you or yourself? Are you a physical body that only experiences thoughts and emotions as a result of biochemical interactions in the brain? That would be a body with a mind. Or is there some non-physical part of you that's pulling the strings but could live outside of your biological body? That would be a mind with a body. That takes us to an old question of whether the body and mind are two separate things. In a famous thought experiment, 16th century philosopher René Descartes pointed out that even if all our physical sensations were just a hallucinatory dream, our mind and thoughts would still be there. That, for him, was the ultimate proof of our existence and it led him to conclude that the conscious mind is something separate from the material body that forms the core of our identity. The notion of a non-physical consciousness echoes the belief of many religions in an immaterial soul for which the body is only a temporary shell. If we accept this, another problem emerges. How can a non-physical mind have any interaction with the physical body? If the mind has no shape, weight, or motion, how can it move your muscles? Or if we assume it can, why can your mind only move your body and not others? Some thinkers have found creative ways to get around this dilemma. For example, the French priest and philosopher Nicolas Mobranich claimed that when we think about reaching for a fork, it's actually God who moves our hand. Another priest philosopher named George Berkeley concluded that the material world is an illusion, existing only as mental perceptions. This question of mind versus body isn't just the domain of philosophers. With the development of psychology and neuroscience, scientists have weighed in as well. Many modern scientists reject the idea that there's any distinction between the mind and body. Neuroscience suggests that our bodies, along with their physical senses, are deeply integrated with the activity in our brains to form what we call consciousness. From the day we're born, our mental development is formed through our body's interaction with the external world. Every sight, sound, and touch create new maps and representations in the brain that eventually become responsible for regulating our experience of self. And we have other senses besides the typical five, such as the sense of balance and a sense of the relative location of our body parts. The rubber hand illusion and similar virtual reality experiments show that our senses can easily mislead us in our judgment of self. They also suggest that our bodies and external sensations are inseparable from our subjective consciousness. If this is true, then perhaps Descartes' experiment was mistaken from the start 
After all, if we close our eyes in a silent room, the feeling of having a body isn't something we can just imagine away. This question of mind and body becomes particularly interesting at a time when we're considering future technologies such as neural prosthetics and wearable robots that could become extended parts of our bodies. Or the slightly more radical idea of mind uploading, which dangles the possibility of immortal life without a body by transferring a human consciousness into a computer. If the body is deeply mapped in the brain, then by extending our sense of self to new wearable devices, our brains may eventually adapt to a restructured version with new sensory representations. Or perhaps uploading our consciousness into a computer might not even be possible unless we can also simulate a body capable of delivering physical sensations. The idea that our bodies are part of our consciousness and vice versa also isn't new. It's found extensively in Buddhist thought, as well as the writings of philosophers from Heidegger to Aristotle. But for now, we're still left with the open question of what exactly our self is. Are we a mind equipped with a physical body, as Descartes suggested? Or a complex organism that's gained consciousness over millions of years of evolution thanks to a bigger brain and more neurons than our distant ancestors? or something else entirely that no one's yet dreamt up. Now this video raises a large number of questions for the applicability of modern psychology. Now is consciousness uh, something that resides within us or is it an epiphenomenon? And what that means is does it arise by chance as a result of uh, our neurons firing in a particular way and giving us the illusion of consciousness and the experience that we uh, associate with that label? And moving on, uh, what we can start to look at are structures and functions of consciousness. So Wilhelm Wundt was known as the founder of modern psychology. He founded the first psychological laboratory at the University of Leipzig in the early 20th century. And what he was interested in looking at was the structure of consciousness and the structure of people's psychological experience. Now essentially what he did was he focused on sensory perception. So he would present a visual stimulus or he would uh, present some kind of auditory stimulus, so either sight or sound, um, and he would ask people to report what is it like to experience that particular stimulus. And he would be using a method called introspection. Now, essentially what that means is people are self-reporting verbally what their experience of that stimulus is like. And from there, Wundt was able to uh, describe the structure of consciousness and the structure of sensory perception. Now, moving on from that, uh, William James went on to ask not just what do we experience in the way that uh, Wundt and his colleagues who were structuralists would do, uh, but he was asking why do we experience the senses that we do? So he was a, uh, a functionalist. He was looking at the, uh, the reasons why, the adaptive reasons why we experience particular sensory perceptions. So why do we experience visual perception in a particular way? What is the, the uh, function of us having our attention directed towards a potentially threatening stimulus and away from something that isn't going to harm us? He was using a much more evolutionary approach, um, looking at kind of natural selection and adapt uh, adaptation to uh, our modern society and our, our environment to see how and not just how, but why we would experience particular perceptions. Now, this has reason, uh, implications for how we uh, understand the human mind even now. Are there particular cognitive structures that we have? Are there particular cognitive abilities that we have that maybe serve a function for us in the modern world? Is there a certain reason why our attention is directed in a particular way? Why we hear certain things? How we uh, experience particular sensations? And is there an adaptive reason for that? Some of the more modern psychological techniques that we'll look at in this module um, do start to address that in a particular way and we'll look at how some of those uh, skills manifest over the next few videos.